What are you doing? Step away from the body of my father. Murder wasn't enough for you? Must you desecrate my father's corpse? Answer me, fool, why do you dissect his body? Child, is this your miracle? You killed the only living thing that truly knew me. You wanted to achieve a goal, and so you have. But did you ever consider the consequences? Come, you apes. Show me your miracles. My old man would say, you show me your miracles and I'll show you mine. My old man regretfully never got the opportunity to say welcome to SCP Cafe. This is the 2019 week 47 recap. I'm your host, Blue Soul, SCP Wiki moderator, chat administrator, author, loving husband, dog petter, clone aficionado, Tottenham Hotspur supporter. Odd times at Tottenham Hotspur lately. Um and slightly inebriated sort of fellow at the moment. Reason being, um, I am in the last couple of days at my current job. I got a new job, and uh, I'm looking forward to, I have a couple of hours tomorrow, and then really nothing uh, penciled in for Sunday, and then I have two full glorious weeks off. I can do whatever I want. And man, that sounds so good. Um, I'm going to make the most of that time, uh, both for, uh, personal projects and stuff I want to advance with the wiki doing stuff for cafe. Um, I intend to do some sort of an ask me anything slash live stream thing for patrons over that time, uh, along with recording a lot of new content, uh, kind of get a little buffer in because I suspect I'm going to be slammed uh, at the new gig for at least a little bit while I get my bearings uh, at the new spot. Obviously, the biggest thing in wiki news right now would be the SCP Russia situation. And last week, I sort of hinted at it that I was going to bring you news and a donation link to go to. And a funny thing happened. Um, so that was Friday, Saturday morning. I was at, at work um, kind of puttering around, getting my desk cleaned up and getting stuff out to my car because in, over the last like three years, I've sort of made myself at home there. Um, but the, uh, fundraiser launched at like 7 AM my time. So I roll in at like nine and we've already raised like $7,000 in two hours. And it kept going and kept going and kept on and on. And within 49 hours and change, we raised $50,000. It was absolutely staggering. Um, The support from the community has been unbelievable. It's been so gratifying to see people understand what's at stake and, you know, give their support in the most tangible way possible. Uh, There's really nothing you can do that helps us out in this situation more than that. So, uh, thank you guys so much. Like on, on behalf of all the staff on the wiki, it's been, uh, a really incredible thing to, uh, to follow. Um, the GoFundMe is still open. If you go to scp-wiki.net, uh, we still have it front and center scp.bz slash fundraiser. Um, that does go to the GoFundMe page that is, uh, being given to a single person. If you look, that does say John Beatty on it. Uh, that is our own Dr. Mann, uh, site master admin. Um, he is ultimately the one in charge. You know, we've got our own, you know, O5 command, we've got our own staff structure and so on. But at the end of the day, man's the one paying the bills for the thing. He's been paying out of pocket to run the wiki for years. And that is, uh, he's a very trustworthy person. His credentials, um, though I won't speak of them, uh, because I haven't really cleared it with him first. Um, I trust him implicitly with the future of the wiki. And I don't think there's a better person to have responsible for these funds. So going forward, the fundraiser is still open. What we intend to do with it is we will basically anything that is left over and truth be told, $50,000 
doesn't get you all that far in the legal world, even in Russia. Um, but what we intend to do with anything that is left over is basically set the funds aside and keep them in a designated legal fund that, you know, in for whatever else may come up in our future that threatens the wiki, um, we have at least a little bit of a head start on it enough to, you know, get a lawyer on retainer and start filling them in on what's going on while we make a plan. Um, people have suggested, you know, well, what if we, you know, we take that leftover money and we use it to fund Project Foundation, we use it to fund the new future of the site. And even though, you know, Project Foundation, which is the name we give to the eventual migration off of the wiki.platform platform and onto our own uh, bespoke platform, as much as I'd love to see it, I was, you know, I strenuously object to us, you know, sort of reallocating the funds later. Um, we don't want to be in a situation where people said, well, I supported you guys because I wanted to see, uh, you know, I wanted to see this, my money used to defend the wiki, you know, fight this legal battle. We don't want to take that and then say, well, we decided once, you know, once it was all said and done, we're just going to use it to, you know, build a new platform. Even if that might be sensible or, you know, a logical progression for our future, um, I think everybody would be more comfortable if we sort of raised those funds separately and we uh, are totally transparent in what the plan is for that part. The support's been so, you know, so solid and it won't take nearly as much money to sort of get off the ground and sort of bootstrap everything. And then after a while, you know, hopefully the thing sort of funds itself. So we don't need as much to get off the ground. So for all of those reasons, um, the the money is still being collected and it will be, you know, whether it's, you know, a month from now, a year from now, or five years from now, it's going to get used for uh, a good cause in the defense of the wiki at some point down the road. Over on the SCP Cafe store, I have a Black Friday sale just going on. I just clicked the button because that's what I do. I click buttons professionally, actually. Uh, the coupon code is Black Friday, all one word. Uh, that will give you 30% off all items in the store. And for patrons, that does stack with your existing uh, coupon codes. Speaking of Patreon, I uh, want to give a uh, special thank you to the new patrons this week. This week we have Onurubu coming all the way from South Africa. So cool. So cool to see the show catching on all over the world. Seeing, I get the emails every morning with like, hey, you're charting in Denmark, Japan, the UK, France. It, it, it's, <laughs> I don't know. You guys seem to like it. Um, you like it more than me some weeks. So I, I guess that's good though. Um, you know, any given week, I think when you're a serial creator, you're going to feel like you, you know, some shows came out better than others. I wasn't honestly all that enthused with last week's. This week's is going to be interesting. Um, we had nine articles in scope. Um, a few of them were quite good, but don't lend themselves remotely well to the podcast format. You end up in a position where you are basically doing like a live reading of the thing, and that's not really what I'm trying to do with this show. Um, so... What I have, I have three to discuss, and I'm going to also mention the long boy of the week. So let's get moving here. SCP-4879, titled Art in the Time of Elitism by Serastes, uh, formerly Dr. Lycus, uh, author of SCP-1322-J, which we covered back during Cliché-Con. That was all the way back in week one. Can you believe it? God, it's crazy it's like it's crazy how time does exactly what it says it's going to do and just keeps on keeps on going uh anyway 4879 has an object class of safe and uh, an image to the right that is captioned scp4879 upon recovery it appears to be sort of a black uh sculpture it looks like uh it's got sort of a bear head and uh uh i i, I don't know where i would place this it doesn't look like uh uh, any sort of like Native American sculpture that I've seen, 
but a uh, very sort of stylistic uh, representation of a bear. Um, our procedures are uh, pretty short. It is contained in a lead lined box in a storage locker. Uh, only D class are to handle the object outside of storage. Contact with it is punishable by reassignment or termination of employment status. The skiff is then described as a soapstone sculpture of a polar bear. 0 0.40 meters in length, mind your significant figures there, can be rewritten as 40 centimeters in length, and weighing 10.2 kilograms, it bears a large stylistic carving of an AX, and those are both in uppercase, so you would assume this is like initials rather than saying a carving of an axe, on its right hindquarter. And uh, we go straight into the uh, the gimmick here. Subjects within a 10 meter radius of the skip will lose their proficiency for a particular area of expertise, uh, seemingly determined by how highly they held the particular talent. Um, the seemingly here is, I think it does work because it's the sort of thing that we would uh, have come to through testing and interacting with the uh, with the item. It goes on to say that subjects of the skip's effect report symptoms such as loss of appetite, headaches, and general confusion that abate in three to five hours. That's a nice little bit of flavor, and um, it is the sort of thing I think we would document fully for the sake of uh, understanding whether that is uh, sort of the typical reaction to exposure to the thing. And it says that while subjects can still recite technical knowledge related to their expertise, they will be totally incapable of actually practicing it beyond uh, a beginner's level. And as of uh, November 15th of this year, uh, all subjects exposed to the skip have been unable to regain any lost proficiency. So it's interesting. It's uh, It would be very, very frustrating, I imagine. Um, our discovery log is all of two, uh, two short paragraphs, uh, was recovered from the Vancouver Art Gallery in British Columbia after an open exhibition night, resulting in 23 artists losing their various skills due to unintentional misinformation on the nature of the anomaly. Four members of eight to 10 see no evil were affected and lost various combat skills requiring them to be placed on indefinite leave. Um, security subjects, I'm sorry, security cameras showed an Asian male, POI 4879, in his approximate late 20s had submitted the skip to the exhibition, paying the entrance fee in cash. The staff reported he later called and apologized for being unable to attend the event due to stomach flu. So we go from that into some logs of basically we've tried this thing out. We have various uh, D class and we have them try various things uh, before and after, and we kind of see what happens. The The common thread with them is that they do understand how to execute on something, but they sort of physically fail to, to do it. Um, it's enough to make you kind of wonder what might happen if, you know, something was purely mental. And I guess few things are that way. There's a physical component at some point, but I guess as you get deeper into the weeds, it would be like more and more of a stretch to have the physical limitations hold you back. Like if, like, say you were really good at math, <laughs> how do you know, like, do, can you just like not uh, hold a pen or type, you know, type on a keyboard? I, I don't know. Um, and it's one of those, like, it's, it's kind of a goofy question to ask. It's not all that relevant, but it did, uh, my, my mind kind of did go down that path. Um, so, you know, watercolor doesn't go well, video games doesn't go well, playing the piano, as you might expect, does not go well. Um, one that was interesting in here was, uh, a foundation doctor that was escorting a D-class carrying the skip back to storage. He tripped, uh, the box broke, exposed the skip to the subject, uh, to our Dr. Alex Siva, in this case, who was an expert in anomaly containment procedures. Um, they were given the descriptions for three new anomalies afterwards and were told to draft provisional containment procedures, and they were found to be completely insufficient at containing the various anomalies' effects. So I guess it's like you have the corpus of knowledge, but um, when it comes time to actually put it into practice, no matter whether it's physically or otherwise, uh, you really can't do it. Um, Dr. Alex Eva does sort of come back as the uh, interviewer in, 
this addendum where we do manage to apprehend the uh, person in question, our anarchist uh, Alex Wynn, who basically already kind of already knows about the foundation. We get to the point pretty early on, asks about the bear sculpture, and he responds, You ever hear of this group called Are We Cool Yet? There's some weird artist collective, mostly down in the States. They make a lot of things like this. And our doctor says, Yes, we're familiar with them. Are you a member? And he says, No, thank God. I knew a few guys who were part of it, but holy shit, they're pretentious as fuck. Just because they can make a painting that makes people want to claw their eyes out or a sculpture that turns you into a lunatic, they think they're better than you and they wave it in your face. So uh, our, so we kind of bury the lead there. This was meant to be a weapon, uh, specifically against some of these members of Are We Cool Yet? Um, I said, I stuck it under a table. I watched the fireworks. They were running around like idiots, crying they couldn't do their stupid anomalous watercoloring or drawing and whatever they do. And uh, our doctor says, so this effect is permanent? There's no method of reversing it? He says, yeah, they're stuck like that. They tried to kill me for that, but they can't really do much when all their talent's gone. They just gave up. I think some of them ended up killing themselves, but I didn't really keep track. And uh, we ask, you know, what about the art gallery? What did they do to upset you there? And he goes, did you see all these, all, you know, all the stuff there? Half of it was that stupid found art bullshit. Who came up with that? Oh, hey, I'm going to throw my garbage on a table, tie it together with string, and pretend it's art. In the same goddamn building where they have four Emily Carr paintings, no less, you people should be thanking me. It's basically a public service. Our doctor doesn't really take the bait there. It says, we amnesticized 23 artists that night. They'll never be able to practice their artistic talents again, you know that? We had to reassign them new identities because it'd be suspicious if they suddenly lost all their abilities. And he goes, oh, talentless hacks that can't string together garbage anymore? Cry me a river. And uh, we ask, why a bear? He says, eh, first thing that came to mind. It's all we're known for, right? Polar bears and politeness for some stupid reason, as if they'd never been downtown. And uh, we ask, how did you acquire your immunity to the object? The P.O.I. says, what? He goes, you said that you'd been in contact with it multiple times, which would have made you susceptible to its abilities. Is it a case of creator immunity or... And he says, oh, I'm not immune. It's the last thing I ever made. I suppose that's fitting, depending on how you look at it. And the doctor says, you knew this would occur? You did this willingly? He says, of course I did. I knew I could never sculpt again, but it was worth the cost. Those worthless pieces of shit can't destroy art any more than they already have. Then I'm the happiest ex-artist in the world. End log and article. We're definitely saying some stuff here. We have some capital O opinions going on behind the scenes. Before we get into that, when you think about the anomaly in itself, it's it's good, right? It's uh, it's something that's kind of. Uh, kind of scary it's not your usual sort of bog standard foundation horror but you know the thing that you're most passionate about and most practiced in all of a sudden like you've still got your body of knowledge but now you can't execute on it at you know any any better than you could in your first week ever checking it out that's that's pretty existential like that's pretty terrifying um so from that perspective i really like it um we have this conversation that is um, you, you know, we can tell there's, you know, some, uh, opinions coming through behind the scenes from, from the author, uh, you know, sort of a commentary about, uh, elitism in art and, uh, and Alex is kind of hypocritical, right? Like this is, he's not any better than those guys. He's making an anomalous thing that, uh, you know, affects these artists they he's honestly doing it for much the same motives as are we cool yet might you know be found guilty of doing so um there's some some complexity to it that is uh understated and i like that about the piece i think you can keep turning it over in your head and you know it's not we don't have like this big huge flashy payoff but i do like the twist that you know this guy was no more uh immune to it than anybody else and was willing to do it anyway um it's just it's a lot of little subtle things that go together to i think make a piece that's better than the sum of its parts and given the length uh you know we talk about build up to payoff ratio i think this is you know really really good on the payoff scale because it doesn't really overstay its welcome um it says what it needs to say and does it in a way that's very compact and has a lot of meaning that you can, you know, 
go and unpack from it later. Um, really well done, a plus one from me. Moving on now, SCP-4394, titled Liquid Piano by Warillium. This is the uh, first time in a little bit I think I've had Warillium on the show. I, I feel like I'm going crazy that 4394 wasn't already a slot in use, but I went and looked through my episode reference and maybe not maybe it's just one of these like i, I should have taken i should have taken that number <laughs> it's on my mind should have fucking been mine uh so liquid piano is a very short piece um you can fit the entire thing in a, a 1080p firefox window um we have an object class of euclid an image to write of a uh piano i don't know enough about pianos to say what kind of piano it is it's black uh the uh, top is uh raised up as you do with a piano it's got some foot pedals three of them they're gold and the caption says it's 4394-a in its solid state so in its solid state it is a piano interesting um the procedures indicate the current supply of dash a is stored in sterile 200 liter drums and i remember having this conversation when i saw 200 liter drums um in 19 where uh, they asked um what's the metric equivalent of a 55 gallon drum i said it's 200 liter drum they're like but no not not just the equivalents like like what are they actually called like no 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 the 55 gallon drum isn't 55 gallons it's 200 liters like just say 200 liter drum <laughs> Uh, there's a little little bit of trivia for you um, anyway so the liquid uh, 4394a stored in drums um, the skip prime if you will scp 4394 and dash b are each contained in separate humanoid containment cells so my the, the given how short this piece is we've got a sort of a prime a dash a and a dash b to keep track of and I think part of my confusion with the piece ultimately is that like the prime and the dash B are the same thing, but the dash A is different. And I don't know what you do for that. Um, perhaps, uh, well, l let me, let me, let me go down a sentence here in our description. The prime skip SCP 4394 is Joaquin Marquez, a former concert pianist with anomalous viscous black fluid dash A in place of blood and we explain a little bit about it it's composed mainly of proteins and organic polymers which seems like sort of a a contradiction in terms it's polymers are very long chains of uh of molecules that i don't i didn't think uh formed in an organic pattern but somebody better at ochem than me can chime in on that and let me know how wrong i am um, when cooled below its freezing point, which is 1.19 degrees Celsius, a quantity of liquid dash A crystallizes into a proportionately sized functional grand piano. For example, freezing a few drops of dash A will result in a piano roughly one centimeter wide. Um, rather than saying a few drops, you can uh, sort of keep uh, in mind a drop is, you know, for most for most liquids is about 0 0.05 milliliters and uh, so you can say you know uh one microliter uh results in a piano one centimeter wide or w whatever um rather than having that sort of vague unscientific a few drops but at the same time just for using uh, sort of an off-the-cuff example i guess that's okay as well um, when ingested, when, you know, oh, this anomalous viscous black fluid coursing through the skip's body, let's drink it. <laughs> We're so fucking stupid. <laughs> um so when we when we drink it because we're stupid dash a will pass through the digestive tract unchanged but may cause mild nausea but it possesses a uh, narcotic and mutagenic properties when injected intravenously oh let's inject the shit into our veins why don't we <laughs> it turns into a piano <laughs> inject the piano in our veins okay uh so when under the influence of piano of dash a subjects experience a noted increase in creativity and productivity as well as a heightened sense of hearing 
Dash A is moderately addictive. Its effects increase in potency before plateauing and tapering off as the dev- as the body develops tolerance to liquid piano. When administered intravenously, it uh, gradually converts the blood, lymph, and cochlear fluid into itself over a period of six to eight weeks. Um, that's k- kind of a muddy sentence, um, just that it's that word itself, um, because you could read that two ways. Our meaning is, is kind of obvious, but um, I think that there's a better way to word that sentence so the reader doesn't stumble right there. Um, this conversion process can be accelerated by continued injections. We injected a lot of fucking people with liquid piano to see just how quickly uh, it they get totally turned into liquid piano. Um, following full conversion of fluids, Dash A subjects report auditory hallucinations of constant piano music and an indistinct male human voice. Otherwise, uh, it functions indistinguishably from the original body fluids. Uh, our prime skip, which was a person, was discovered bound in the basement of one Mackenzie Lawrence, now Dash B, who had been in, uh, extracting and injecting Dash A for an estimated seven months. Uh, other objects found in the basement include, and we've got our bullet points, uh, original and unfinished sheet music composed by Skip Prime, who was tied up in the basement, um, partial and whole instruments owned or used by Skip Prime at various points in his life, including a grand piano whose, live, whose lid had been carved with a depiction of uh, their own face, apparently. Several thousand photographs of Skip Prime of Joaquin Marquez, dating over a period of 19 years, and the body of their high school music teacher, of Marquez's high school music teacher. It's lovely. Um, Skip Prime and Dash B were subsequently contained and administered a psychiatric treatment. And we end the article there. The abruptness of the ending is interesting. Um, this is the sort of thing that I uh, sort of mutter to myself, you know, get in, hit them, get out, you know, sort of punch them in the face and, uh, and get away before they have a chance to realize what you just told them. Um, what you just did to them. Um, it's a really gnarly story. And it's like, I don't know how hooked I am on the, uh, the dash a, which really is sort of the, uh, the anomaly here, right? Like, I think you could get away with saying that, you know, just having the liquid be SCP-4394 saying it is extracted, you know, from, this Joaquin Marquez and then this other Mackenzie Laurent, our dash B can be our, uh, well, POI isn't really, uh, isn't really good either. Is it because they've been fully apprehended and, uh, there's not really a person of interest when they've got this guy fucking tied up in their basement with their high school music teacher, you know, dead in the corner of the room. So I don't know. I feel like there is a better way to structure the various elements in a way that you don't have to keep up with what's what. Um, because, you know, dash A, dash B, skip itself, it's not, it's it's never really intuitive which is which here. And that's probably the biggest thing it has going against it. But if that's the biggest thing it has going against it, that's okay. This is, this is good. And at plus 55, it seems like a lot of people agree there is still a very healthy market for short works, folks. Um, you know, plus 55 for, you know, something you can fit all on one page. Those are pretty good numbers. And, uh, with, uh, let's see here. I haven't upvoted this yet. Plus 56. Uh, it's good. You know, I, I think the, uh, the shorter you make the piece and can still tell an interesting story, the more likely people are to upvote it in general, because you didn't take up all that much of their time. They didn't have to get all that invested and they come away satisfied. So yeah, get in, hit them and get out. Well done plus one from me. Before we move on, AIS Mallard would like to plug SCP-4560, Everything is Fine, calls it an excellent piece on real-life socialization and self-quarantine of emotional expression. It's not too long. I highly recommend giving it a full read-through. This is one written by SCP Wiki moderator Jacob Conwell. Conwell is... Uh, low-key one of the more pivotal members of wiki staff he does a little bit of everything 
and the site is so much better off for having had him in it. Um, it's a great piece. Um, really, really thoughtful social commentary on uh, a lot of things that we've just sort of accepted as the the way that things are and will always be in modern society, despite a lot of advancements in other areas, sort of the identity of being a man and, you know, men, I mean, it's like men don't have feelings, right? Like that's kind of what you're, it's, it's sort of pounded into you, you know, suck it up, you know, don't cry. What are you crying for? Um, it's obviously the, the piece itself is more subtle than all that, but it is, uh, very relevant and very powerful. Also, before we get into the last skip of the week, sorry to say, uh, the long boy of the week, SCP-4793, titled Steely by Dyslexian. Um, God, this was a really good piece. Um, incredibly underrated, I think, right now at plus 36. It is one of the longer pieces I've seen in the last couple of months. We've got a really interesting and moving story about, um, we'll call it a statue come to life, um, that was in its past surrounded by uh, figures of mythos and uh, trying to sort of find their identity, find their own identity and not being bound to the uh, the past that it had. Um, it's quite lengthy, but I think just about all of it is useful. There's no real wasted motion in any of it. Um, we spend time either building up our various characters, of which we did a good job in, you know, this is still a short story in building up uh, a number of very identifiable characters. And uh, then in doing so, you get sort of a greater feeling of reward when they end up uh, being rewarded for their actions in whatever way that might transpire. Really touching. It ended the way that I thought it would and that I thought it should. Um, and very much worth your time. Um, you know, get comfy, <laughs> um, you know, grab something, uh, grab a cup of coffee, a warm mug of tea, or, you know, or if you're like me right now, uh, uh, makers and Coke and, uh, enjoy it. Um, it was a, it was a really good read. Now, last but not least, SCP-4612. Not all gods decompose. This is by Grigory Karpin. This is a first-timer piece. This was a really good first-timer piece. It is also quite lengthy on another week. This would have probably gotten the long boy treatment as well. Um, so this is not going to be a full, full recap. It'll be something close to it, though. So the first thing that jumps out at me with this is the object class. It's uncontained. Um, truth be told, at the end of the day, I don't know if it's, um, since we sort of have two parts to it, the uncontained designation is sort of questionable, but not so questionable that I'm like going to waste a ton of time on it. Um, our procedures are comparatively very, very short. Um, it notes that due to the extreme difficulty in relocating dash a, we've set up a perimeter um, and anybody found within this perimeter should be interrogated to see if they are connected to the serpent's hand, and if so, they are to be, quote, processed by the ethics committee. Um, that's good and, uh, like, sinister, but it, it may clash with uh, a number of currently popular interpretations of what the EC actually gets up to these days. Um, dash B, on the other hand, is uncontained at this time, as its whereabouts are unknown. Foundation web crawler IO Metatron, which I like, uh, it's a little subtle thing for where we're going with, with the piece. Um, Metatron is an angel that appears in a number of early, uh, Jewish and Islamic religious texts. Um, we go on, so Metatron is to scrub all social media and internet postings for mentions of a figure fitting the description of Dash B and MTF Beta 777 Hecate's Spear are to be notified of sightings of Dash B. So the skip designation refers to two related anomalies. This was an interesting way to go about it, um, but we actually do okay keeping them, you know, uh, all sort of separate and not 
so tied up in what dash A is and dash B um, because we focus a lot on dash A through most of the work and dash B shows up just sort of at the end. Um, so dash A is the body of a large lamassiform invertebrate uh, that is uh, a $10 word for slug. Um, it consists of white translucent uh, flesh with elastic texture. Um, it shows no sign of decay despite centuries having passed. Since estimated time of death, the cadaver is 10 meters in length and 1 meter in width, lying it on a stone altar. Uh, the anatomy includes six human arms, three meters in length. Each one has a hand with ten fingers and a crystal structure in the palm and a long fin traveling down the length of it. Now, um, given that we've called it an invertebrate, um, the where are the arms coming from? Like, we've got some bones in here somewhere. Um, we kind of note further on in here that we can't really get a good... Uh, image of the internals of the thing uh, it tends to absorb our uh, x-rays and so on so we we don't really know what's going on in there um, so there's also a lengthwise uh, posthumously executed incision on the underside of this slug the blood is bright blue and uncoagulated uh, additionally the cadaver can uh, emits considerable amounts of a kiva radiation the uh scientific measurement of divine grace uh we talked about this not too long ago with uh spike brennan's latest work that was um scp 4436 back in the week 35 show so a kiva radiation coming off of this thing um we for how we've used a kiva radiation consistently in the wiki um, we really don't have to beat around the bush um, that we are dealing with something uh, of a divine origin. Um, our footnote here is interesting. We call it physically quantifiable measurement of the prime thaumaturgical force. Um, we don't expand on that, and I think that's okay. Um, I like, you know, that we've, we're fleshing it out just a little bit. Um, so this dash A, this slug, is in an underground structure beneath our provisional site, which is a uh, an 18th century manor in Yorkshire, commonly referred to as Eckhart House. And our image uh, in the article is of Eckhart House, uh, old stone building with uh, two visible floors. Um, looks to be, you know, an old building that you might find in Europe, uh, in England. So it continues... Um, there's an underground structure beneath the wine cellar. The door is inscribed with various glyphs, which at one time induced a mild cognito hazard, uh, causing the viewer to ignore the entryway. Um, within the structure, there are stone blocks. Many of them are charred and warped from heat. And there are cuneiform glyphs uh, for an unknown purpose etched onto the surface of many of these blocks. And we describe very briefly dash B as a humanoid 1.75 meters tall, average build, and bright blue glowing eyes. Um, it has demonstrated the ability to manipulate thermal energy and exhibited anomalous strength far beyond what is expected given its height and build. And dash B has referred to dash A as its father, despite being two distinct species. And we have a note saying C incident dash one so we from here go into a number of um of collapsibles the first one is probably the one that is like the most suspect as far as we're taking up a lot of time and because this thing is is fairly lengthy it's about two you know uh like page heights worth of stuff we've got an 05 header that this is normally level five cleared material that we are releasing to level three uh, to view and try and understand the origins and significance of dash A. And basically we are um, trying to connect old accounts of an entity that would um, sort of, we, we would notice these backslides of technological capabilities of cultures throughout histories, and it would hit sort of a backstop um, upon being introduced to this being. 
We have a discovery log indicating that we discovered it in 1986. We were surveilling a Serpent's Hand member um, onto the grounds of this house, and uh, we observed them perform some sort of ritual and enter the door to the underground structure where Dash A was. We uh, noted the POI kneeling before the remains weeping. Um, we noted Dash A and detained our POI, called in for reinforcements, and our MTF uh, moved in and basically took over shop. And we note um, an MTF uh, accompaniment by Agent Rebecca Douglas, a senior researcher and level three psychometrist, which uh, sort of necessitates a footnote. Um, it says, the ability to make relevant associations from an object of unknown history by making physical contact with that object Individuals assessed by psionics division as level three psychometry can read surface emotions and history from individuals they touch. Very interesting. Um, we basically brought in an entirely new sort of vehicle for trying to tell the story for exposition here. Um, we go on in the discovery log, uh, the site survey revealed no other anomalies beyond this cadaver and 23 human male corpses surrounding it most of whom had also been significantly charred and warped uh, skeletal structures due to exposure to significant heat, um, and several of them were dismembered due to blunt force trauma. Um, our agent noted significant psychic trauma present in all human remains on site. You don't say. Um, one thing that's cool here is as we're doing this, we have images on the, uh, on the right, um, just a couple of extra little flavor pieces. We have a door, a bright blue door set in a stone wall. And that's apparently our entrance to the underground vault housing dash a, then below that, we've got some, uh, some glyphs, uh, in columns and it's all, you know, this is nice little flavorful stuff that you can add and, uh, really give that extra sense of depth, uh, and immersion to the piece. We have an interview with this POI, and what we get out of it is basically that they are convinced this is a god of some sort, and that the timing of its appearance is highly, to them, uh, connected to the Industrial Revolution, to an advance in technology. And the next bit in here is probably um, the piece that is most uh, able to be pitched and uh, not really hurt the piece. We have some historical context explaining the owner of Eckhart House being an occultist and going into some history in the 1770s and a couple of letters um, from him to uh, a couple of uh, contacts. Um, it's nice flavor, but the piece is so long that um, the flavor, you know, you're sort of doing that at the expense of not advancing the story at the same time like you can you know they've kind of chosen to do one or the other um you know we have sort of a connection to the wanderer's library in here but i don't think enough to um justify the significant length that these little sections add so we're gonna kind of pass over it i don't think it buys us enough to to get deeply into it and go into our examination of dash a um, we tried to move it it didn't work uh, it appears to be really, really dense. Um, we estimate it to weigh somewhere over 26,000 kilograms. Um, the altar where the body lies uh, must therefore also be anomalous, given its ability to hold that much weight without losing any structural integrity. Um, we decided uh, it's not cost-effective to try and move this fucking thing, so we set up the provisional site instead, and we try to do some some surgical samples of the thing and this is one of those that this as far as flavor i think is more interesting than the historical flavor because it's more in line with um what we might see in sort of a modern log here's what we know about the thing um like noting you know sort of the uh crystalline structures and talking about the Akiva radiation being higher in some places than others, and noting that the remains absorb radiation. Um, so uh, we tried to do an ultrasound and an MRI, and we found a complete lack of internal organs. I don't know if an MRI will honestly work for this thing. We call it a portable MRI, 
which I think is a misnomer because MRI machines are fucking gigantic. Um, but, you know, the Foundation has access to cool shit, so maybe they've solved that problem. Um, in any event, we have a good amount of length in here that doesn't advance the story significantly, and we're sort of trading uh, flavor for uh, length here. You have to be careful with that uh, as long as the piece is. So we have then an internal memo saying, you know, basically requesting to do additional research on it, trying to understand as much as we can about it. Um, I don't know if the memo says quite enough to justify its inclusion. It's basically the sort of stuff that we know the foundation is going to be up to. We want to sample various things and understand what the thing was and you know it's it's we could probably just assume the entirety of it so our next uh really relevant piece here is the actual the psychometric analysis of dash a so we have our psychometrist uh on site trying to uh feel around on the remains and doesn't find any anything uh, all that strong says it's faint i can feel something just under the surface but something's blocking me and uh our uh, other researcher says, well, maybe the event was too long ago for much to be left. And uh, agent says, no, that can't be it. There's enough psychic trauma in the stones of that hallway to give to give me a headache, so this thing should be ten times as much. Hold on, I've got an idea. And the doctor says, what? She goes, you squeamish? Says, oh, please, who do we work for? I like that little, that little uh, bit of dialogue there. And our psychometrist says, okay, I'm going to try something. She takes a couple breaths removes her hands from the skin of this slug, the epidermis of it, and plunges them into the incision all the way up to the elbows. And uh, <laughs> it's pretty gnarly, you know, especially since we've acknowledged this thing is not decomposed at all. Um, that's pretty pretty out there. And in doing so, uh, she screams and a... The, we have an issue here. It says, a, sh- a shock wave of psychic energy whips out from where Douglas stands, shattering glass bulbs throughout provisional site 91. Um, I, the tone there is not good. Um, that whole sentence is, is kind of bad and needs, uh, needs a little more work. Um, so we, uh, our doctor then activates some chemical light sticks so we can see what's going on. And, uh, the agent is, uh, sort of fall into her knees but her hands are still inserted into this incision along dash a's body and uh at this point we start to have sort of some uh some denouement here with uh various shimmering figures uh starting to come out from this incision site from from this dash a who emerges from this but our william henry eckhart the uh benefactor of the place he owns the place you know um he is in this blue shimmering self standing over the corpse of dash a um holding a knife in the air chanting in garbled aramaic um the audio quality is apparently poor so we can't really decipher what they're saying and he sinks the blade into dash a slicing along its length and continues chanting as he slips one hand into the incision, overlaying himself onto our agent's position. And uh, this apparently wasn't uh, the greatest idea. Um, 20 uh, other people uh, are in this room uh, matching this man's chanting. Uh, Eckhart holds the knife up. It's covered in this blue blood, and the knife begins to glow a dull red. And at this point, a bright light engulfs the room the structure shakes and the ceiling begins to crumble as a beam of bright light illuminates the room as the light fades a new individual uh, is visible a few feet from dash a and mr eckhart it's dressed in a long cloak and wears a tricorn hat which is interesting um it's like your old uh, you know revolutionary war era fancy hat and uh, this dash B, you know, asks, what are you doing? And uh, Eckhart steps back, dropping the knife, and uh, stumbles and says, good God, what are you? And B says, step away from the body of my father. And he does so. And uh, 
He continues, murder wasn't enough for you? Must you desecrate my father's corpse? At this point, Eckhart is uh, kind of shit out of luck. He's sweating, looking, turning at the other figures. Nobody is uh, supporting him in this. And he says, I, I had no idea. I didn't even know it was a he. And B says, answer me, fool. Why do you dissect his body? Eckhart says, I, that is to say, we wanted to use it for a ritual working, for the productions of miracles. And B says, child, is this your miracle? And points at Dash A. Says, you killed the only living thing that truly knew me. And Eckhart says, it was not our intention to. And uh, doesn't get any farther than that. As Dash B lashes out, uh, his hand passing through Eckhart's torso and exploding out his back. <laughs> uh, he then grasps Eckhart's body and tears it in two. As he does so, the two halves begin to smolder and then burn as they fall to the floor of the chamber. It's not a good day for the people in this room. Um, other figures in the room are screaming. Some try to flee. Uh, Dash B looks up. Um, his eyes are, you know, this sort of blazing bright blue. And one of the other figures steps forward holding out his palms and said, Sir, please, William was the architect of this drama. We had scarce knowledge of, our, of your father's existence. We had only improved... To, uh, we'd only hoped to improve the lot of all mankind. In our wildest dreams, this result would have still seemed outlandish. I beg you, have mercy. And uh, at this point, Dashby has a moment of pause, looks at this speaker, steps forward and places its hand on the speaker's shoulder, and says, You wanted to achieve a goal, and so you have. But did you ever consider the consequences? And as he says this, the man begins to smolder and then burn. Uh, his scream is only cut off by a strike of Dash B's hand, and he says, Come, you apes, show me your miracles. And the recording, and it's interesting, it says the recording continues for another 12 minutes. You know, we sort of can understand this is sort of a flashback thing, um, but to call it a recording as such is probably a little too on the nose. Um, it continues for another 12 minutes as Dash B kills each of the 21 other figures using fire and blunt force trauma. Uh, and after it's finished, uh, it stands before the corpse of Dash A, sinks to its knees in the same space occupied by Agent Douglas, and the blue light from Dash A dims, the image of Dash B fades, leaving the structure as it appeared at the beginning of the recording, and at this point our agent collapses. They spent five weeks in recuperation. Uh, in that time, she was rarely conscious, and a figure resembling Dash B was seen entering uh, her room, on video surveillance, 36 days after her collapse, uh, security staff was mobilized and sent to her quarters, but there was no sign of Dash B. Um, security approached our agent, and she was alert, and had a thumbprint on her forehead just above the bridge of her nose. Medical personnel were not able to clean this mark from her skin, and uh, during debriefing, uh, Douglas was asked to recount any discussion with Dash B prior to arrival of the security staff, uh, and she said that Dashby claimed she was only alive because she was merely investigating. Additionally, uh, she claimed significant interference of her psychometry, and all she could sense were the following words being repeated, Eckhart died for a reason, and the search for Dashby is ongoing and article. So, a lot to unpack here. Um... And it's always a little frustrating when a piece this long has so little discussion going on in it. In fact, there's only one comment in the uh, discussion that would, you know, resemble any sort of, of critique. And that is from, uh, from many meets, you know, doing some site crit work. Um, I, I really enjoyed this piece. Um, it is for a first time piece. It's ambitious. Um, we cover a lot of ground, and it has some of those sort of first-timer trappings. There are a number of uh, spelling, punctuation, and grammar issues with it that I'm I've sort of glossed over in the in the recap here. Um, and then it's like you have this thing where, as a first-timer, you see all of the different ways you can take a story, all of the different things you can include. Do I need a discovery log? Do I, you know, how much context do I need to give? Um, and the uh, sort of default reaction, if you 
have the the uh, writing chops to do it is to include all of it and you know hopefully that way you satisfy all the you know all the readers at the same time because it's got everything that you know everything that you've seen is is in the piece um the trouble with that is that it makes it long as hell so um the longer the thing is we talk about build up to pay off the the bigger it is the more uh you've got to deliver at the end um i liked sort of the the flashback through these images sort of thing that we did i think we could have done a little something in addition to it to maybe show this isn't just like a canned recording that this is something that's being shown specifically for their benefit um but i don't if you know if if you put a gun to my head right now and told me what you know how to do that i couldn't tell you so um you know the the issues with it are all things where it's like you know trying a little too hard to uh make everybody happy and this is sort of the uh the flip side of that is you do enough of that and nobody's happy because it's like well yes you've got the bit that i like but we've buried it in so much other stuff that i don't care about that you know by the time i get to my bit or i get to my bit early but then with the rest of it i'm bored so there's uh enough going on here um that i understand why all of the various pieces were included but at the same time sometimes the omission will be more worth your while because you have to really think about what the reader is going to get out of the uh out of that section out of this letter um what are you wanting to convey to the reader have you already done that somewhere else or do you intend to do that somewhere else in the piece and if so don't do it ax it um there's very little to be gained uh sometimes in really uh going too deeply into uh deep motives of the people that were that have been dead and gone for hundreds of years particularly if you're already going to do a flashback thing um you could you know paint this guy as you know sort of a dick occultist um with just a couple of sentences of dialogue in this little flashback and saved yourself you know several lengthy letters that said these are good problems to have they demonstrate a good understanding of the various uh pieces that you can sort of pick up and play with in an article like this and you know that's uh for for a first timer piece it's really good i have high hopes and i suspect with a little more um, mastery of when to say less and when to, uh, you know, when to kind of understand that you've said enough and let the reader um, pick up the important bits out of what you have uh, remaining in the article. Um, I have very high hopes for this author. This was a plus one for me. Now, before we get on out of here, I have a single mailbag question this week from AIS Mallard. He asks, what was something you learned from the cafe store that you didn't expect you'd need to do? I thought about this for a bit, and I gotta say, shipping is a pain in the ass, and I'm amazed people do it at all. Um, I have so many envelopes and rigid envelopes and bubble mailers and apparel mailers and... It's all different sizes because, wouldn't you know, the one that you got is just like a quarter of an inch too, you know, too narrow to fit this particular thing and you can't do a damn thing about it. And uh, it's like, if I could just roll up the shit in like duct tape and slap a stamp on it and I knew it would come out the other side okay, uh, I'd be I'd be all over that. But uh, you can't, so um, it's it's absurd like for the money i've spent on the cafe like like okay so this as sort of as a franchise or as as a whole big thing my biggest expense um has been well the recording gear this microphone my mixer and beyond that um a couple of the uh big pieces of hardware i have a heat press i have a vinyl cutter um i've got a really nice uh work surface but actually i've spent more on shipping stuff than on some of this hardware just having enough stuff on hand to reliably get stuff out on time 
um, because you don't know in advance what all this stuff's going to be. So it's like some of this stuff is custom size. Some of it's going to be certain combinations of things or just, oh, well, it doesn't quite fit in that envelope now, does it? Oh, okay, so that's a size up. Oh, I don't have anything bigger. Lovely. <laughs> it's a pain in the ass. Um, so that that's probably it. Um, everything else um, is stuff I've kind of done in the past. Um, I own, I, this is not my first business. Um, I owned my own business. When I was 17, I had a walk-in uh, computer repair shop uh, next door to a radio shack. And so then I learned a lot of the uh, legal side of things, the business side of things, getting your EIN and your SS4, your DBA, like all of this stuff that goes into presenting a storefront. Um, a lot of it was in the same sort of vein for the LLC. The LLC is a little more involved, but not too much. Um, it's not as bad as people make it out to be. And then, you know, being here in the, uh, in the high desert of New Mexico, the, uh, regulations for, uh, incorporating are, are pretty, pretty relaxed. It's pretty chill. And I'm pretty happy about that. So, um, yeah, the, the, the store has been, it's been interesting. There's still stuff I want to do at the store, but it's just, it's for whatever reason, it's like, there's only enough hours in the day, you know, only so many. And at some point stuff takes a backseat and the store tends to get that. Um, cause I'm not like, I don't have any ambitions that it's ever like, I'm not going to pay my bills with, with the cafe store. Um, cause by the time it gets to the level where I theoretically could, I would have to like totally rethink how I do a lot of things because the stuff is too labor intensive to actually put out that sort of order volume. So, um, it's a lot of stuff. Um, it's been challenging at times, but also it's been really fun and really rewarding. So if you want to get into it, jump in, see, see what happens. So we're about out of here. Um, for the next couple of weeks, keep eyes and ears peeled. Content may drop at any given time. I'm going to be gloriously off for two solid weeks. I'm going to try and put some stuff out there for everybody. And, uh, so, you know, if, if you asked me right now, what day stuff's coming out, psh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think the first couple of days I'm just going to fucking relax and just be totally chill and do whatever I feel like. And, pr and that's probably going to be like a lot of video games. Like I'm hooked on Slay the Spire right now. And, uh, it's going to be probably a good amount of that. And beyond that, uh, <laughs> I'll figure it out as I go. So, uh. I'll keep you posted. Um, week 48 should be on Friday. Well, that is Black Friday, isn't it? Um, I will be... Yeah, I'll be here. Why not? I'm not going out in that shit. <laughs> I'm already on vacation. If I want something that bad, I'll freaking, you know, I can go early. Everybody does stuff online now anyway. You just, you know, freaking order it online, get it shipped to you. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think I'll be here for week 48. And uh, until then, keep reading, keep writing. I'll see you on the other side.